There we go. Okay, thank you, Mary. And um, I am delighted to be here. So I'll describe myself. I'm a rather short white woman with curly dark hair. I'm in my study at my desk. In the background, you can see my wall with floating bookshelves and I am wearing a floral patterned dress. Before I was on the Koffler board, I was a Vine Awards juror myself. I know how difficult it is to choose among the thoughtful, diverse, and entertaining Jewish books submitted. And you will see over the next few days and panels how strong our Canadian writers are in all of the categories. I'll introduce the writers and our interviewer to you now. Shortlisted in the young adult children's literature category is Michelle Barker for her novel, My Long List of Impossible Things, published by Annick Press. The Vine Awards jury says of this book, a compelling YA novel from the standpoint of a 16 year old German girl navigating her survival through the Soviet occupation at the end of World War II. A page turner where the reader grapples with the ethics of truths and lies and the upended norms of right and wrong. Michelle Barker is an author and editor who lives in Vancouver, BC. Her fiction, nonfiction and poetry have been published in literary reviews around the world. Her novel, The House of 1000 Eyes, has won numerous awards, including the Amy Mathers Teen Book Award. Her newest novel, My Long List of Impossible Things, was named a Junior Library Guild Gold Standard Selection. And Michelle holds an MFA in creative writing from UBC and works as a senior editor at the Darling Axe. And Michelle's gonna describe herself to you now. Hi, uh, I am a white woman and I have dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. I'm wearing glasses and I've got a patterned shirt on, a black and beige. I'm sitting at my kitchen table, which you actually can't see, but behind me is a large colorful painting. Uh, it has fruit, pears and limes and oranges on it and a large blue vase um, on a red background, which makes it sound a little bit chaotic, but it's actually quite pretty. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, so next is Gordon Corman for his book, War Stories, published by Scholastic Canada. And this is also shortlisted in the Young Adult Children's Literature category. The Vine Awards jury says of this book, War Stories brings World War II history to life in an engaging way that is accessible for younger readers without glamorizing or sugarcoating the horrors of war. Alternating flashbacks to the past are interwoven with the present along two adjacent narrative arcs. Two families are implicated in events coming to a head. The liberation of a small town in France, a hero's welcome and a blood debt stemming back to a grave miscalculation. Here are dramatic action packed scenes with life and death stakes, the random luck of survival and a younger generation who must come to terms with the past. Gordon Corman is the beloved writer of 90 something books for kids and teens. He's a New York Times number one bestselling author and has written many popular series, including the 39 Clues series. His first book, This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall, was published by Scholastic when Gordon was only 14. And he has been writing successfully ever since. Gordon grew up in Thornhill, Ontario, and he now lives in New York with his family. Gordon, I'll ask you to describe yourself now. Uh, thank you. I am a uh, white, bald guy with glasses, uh, middle-aged, depending on how many 116-year-olds you hang out with. I am in my office, uh, which my wife describes as needing an update. Thanks, Gordon. And our final shortlisted author on the panel today is Carol Windley, whose novel Midnight to Prague, published by HarperCollins, was shortlisted in the fiction category. The Vine Awards jury says of this book, 
Midnight to Prague's epic sweep encompasses multiple countries and multiple decades as the protagonist and her entourage of richly realized characters come of age and ultimately struggle to survive in interwoven journeys throughout Central Europe and to Argentina during the decades between the end of the First World War and the end of the Second. Winley has conjured her setting so intricately and woven her characters' lives together so cleverly and densely that to enter this book is to travel inside a fully realized universe, its nooks and crannies replete with treasures. Carol Winley is the author of the novel Breathing Underwater and two short story collections, the Scotiabank Giller Prize winner, fi sorry, finalist, Homeschooling, as well as Visible Light, which won the Bumpershoot Weyerhaeuser Prize and was nominated for the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize and the Governor General's Literary Award. She lives with her husband on Vancouver Island. And Carol, I'll ask you to describe yourself now. Thank you, Cynthia. I am a white woman. I um, wear, I'm wearing glasses. I have gray hair. I'm wearing a black top and sitting in a room with dark rose colored walls. There's a window behind me and uh, a chair and a cabinet with a lamp on it. And I think that's it. Thank you, Carol. Our interviewer today is Naomi K. Lewis, and she was a juror for this year's Vine Awards. Naomi is a fiction and nonfiction writer, editor, and creative writing teacher in Calgary. She wrote the novel Cricket in a Fist and the story collection I Know Who You Remind Me Of, and co-edited with Rona Altro's the anthology Shy. Her journalism has been shortlisted for provincial and national magazine awards, and her 2019 memoir, Tiny Lights for Travelers, won the Vine Award for Canadian Jewish Literature for Nonfiction, the Alberta's Wilfred Eggleston Award for Nonfiction, and the Pinsky Givon Prize for Nonfiction, a Western Canada Jewish Book Award. It was also a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction and the W.O. Mitchell City of Calgary Book Award. Naomi, I turn it over to you now. Hi, thanks, Cynthia. Um, to describe myself, I am yet another middle-aged white woman with dark curly hair and green eyes. And behind me, I'm wearing black. And behind me is a bookshelf with books on it and a violin that I don't really know how to play. Um, I'm going to start talking now with all the panelists. So if everybody wants to turn on their cameras and unmute, we can start to have a conversation. All right, hello everybody. Welcome and congratulations on being shortlisted. I have lots of questions uh, for all of you, but I think I'm going to start with a very general one. Since this panel is about the Second World War and stories of survival, um, I wanted to ask, I mean, I know I wrote a book that was also set in the Second World War and is a story of survival. So I kind of, I know I had the feeling of, you know, there's so many books already written about this, um, asking myself, do I have something new to offer? and ultimately deciding uh, that I thought so. And obviously all of you have had the same, um, come to the same conclusion. So I'm just wondering how you decided to write about this era that has you know, been written about quite a bit and how you decided to come at it from the particular angle that you did, which is quite different in each of your cases. So I know that's very general, but I'm just gonna start there and I'll start um, by asking you, Michelle. Oh, okay. Well, uh, my mother grew up in Germany during World War II. So it, um, it's been a subject that has fascinated me for quite a long time now. I grew up listening to her stories and um, it's always been something that I've thought about doing. And 
I have written a couple of other books set in Germany and basically everything that I write that is German related is, is inspired by her. Um, and she was just a little girl during the second world war. So it's the book, my long list of impossible things is not her story. It actually started out as her story when I first started writing it. And that was a very bad decision. <laughs> it mm. just did not, it, mixing fact and fiction just didn't really work for me. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't make it work. She was only eight or nine years old. And I, uh, the, the subject matter combined with her age, just, um, I, I, I just couldn't do it. So I had to basically throw out most of the manuscript and start over again and really, um, come at it from a fictional point of view, although the beginning of the novel, um, when the Soviets invade and, and show up at the home and kick the family out is actually directly from, from my mother's experience. Oh my goodness. So yeah, it, it, with, you know, the, the, with Mutti holding up the cookie sheet and everything, that's actually, that's actually what happened. But from then on, it, it veers completely into fiction. Um, so, and then you asked about uh, the, the angle that, that we chose. Um, and and whether we thought we had something to offer well something obviously new, something you new to offer well no but i mean something new and i guess i guess for me it, it was the german point of view number one um which is thin ice to skate on mm -hmm. um and then also uh the end of the second world war when uh, the soviets invaded i i didn't feel that there was a lot out there uh particularly for young readers um and so that was uh, another reason why i chose that particular era I think you're right that it is it is a tough it's not written about that much probably and it probably is because it feels like this um like yeah it's not the germans place to say that they suffered too from the second well, war or whatever although it yeah. is in fact the case right well um, it was tough that, that that's what made it so hard it's it's like okay what can I actually say that I'm, is not going to offend literally everybody? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, I did feel that there was, when I looked at my mother's experience, for example, as a, as a nine-year-old girl being kicked out of her home and wandering the streets and having Soviets pointing their guns at her, she was an innocent person yeah. in all of this. And she, of course, there were lots of children um, and women and elderly people as well who, who really were innocent and ended up sort of bearing the brunt of... of uh, of what happened from the you know from the soviets and and the other people who were invading and so i i felt like that was i felt like that was a story that needed to be told but it was not an easy one to tell for sure yeah i can absolutely understand that it wouldn't be um and on on that note maybe would you like to give us a short reading now oh sure yeah Great. um okay so You've heard a little bit about what the, the novel is about. Um, Katja is the main character. She's 16 years old. And so she's kicked out of her home with her sister and her mother. And one of the things that she has to leave behind is her piano and her dreams of being a concert pianist. Um, she had a Jewish piano teacher. And as the details of the Holocaust come to light, she has to come to terms with what likely happened to him, but also with how much her family knew and didn't know. So um, the scene I'm gonna read is uh, when she's thinking back to when she first uh, became a student of, um, of Herr Goldstein. Lessons with Frau Erdmann were all right until the afternoon I came to her and said, I wanna learn Chopin's waltz in C-sharp minor. She fussed with her eyeglass chain. That's far too complicated for you, dear. No, I said, it's too complicated for you. She whisked the duet book off the music stand. Go to Solomon Goldstein then. He's the one who should teach you. Who? No one. She glanced at the walls. Nothing. I went home and told Mutti, I need a new teacher, Solomon Goldstein. Solomon Goldstein, she said, as if the name weighed a hundred kilos. Impossible. Puppy said the same. Why, I asked, have you heard of him? Is he not taking new students? Not Aryan students, Puppy said. I doubt he's even allowed to have a musical instrument. What? Why not? I said he's a piano teacher. Puppy changed the subject to cows. There was always a lot to say about the cows, their calves, the quality and quantity of milk, the sales in town. But the idea echoed in my head like the theme in a fugue. All four voices took it up, subject and answer, Solomon Goldstein, until I found out where he lived and showed up at his little house. Impossible, he said when I introduced myself. I can't teach you. I don't even have a piano. Both of those things turned out not to be true. The piano was hidden in the cellar, 
where the sound didn't carry. All I had to do was play for him once. Herr Goldstein agreed to teach me if I swore to continue my pretend lessons with Frau Erdmann and not breathe a word of the secret lessons to anyone. Why can't I tell, I asked. He did not talk about cows. I'll get in trouble. What kind of trouble? The kind that involves the SS and the Gestapo. The man in long leather coats who drove big black Mercedes Benzes. People kept their heads down whenever they passed. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Gordon. So okay. Gordon, same question about how you came to write about this topic. And I know you've written many, many books and this does seem like perhaps a bit of a, a departure for you in terms of- For sure. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, uh, I, I've been writing kind of adventure series uh, for a while and um, you know, sort of survival kind of shipwreck kids and, you know, break the record for the youngest climber on top of Mount Everest. And eventually I, um, I did one on the Titanic. I, I wrote a, a trilogy about kids on the Titanic and I, I had never written any kind of historical fiction before. And, and I, I just was totally hooked and I wanted to do it again. Uh, and, you know, I didn't have a topic, but I, but I just sort of thought World War II would be perfect. You know, uh, I just thought that it would be, you know, a fascinating topic for me, but also a fascinating topic for kids. Um, and that's really what War Stories sort of started out as was uh, originally going to be this this World War Two trilogy. And I had all kinds of grand plans. I was going to involve, you know, kids fighting through the resistance or, you know, kidnap nuclear scientists or whatever. I, I had all kinds of ideas spinning uh, and. It was my editor who kind of grounded me and, and sort of said, you, you know, this would be great if you could keep it like a little bit more uh, sort of connected to the experience of, of kids. And I, I sort of thought to myself, you know, you always sort of feel with, with the subject of World War II and kids, you know, particularly kids who grew up with, you know, Marvel movies and, and kind of superhero movies where every second word you hear in the media is, is like, you know, the entire future of the world is at stake and, you know, the forces of evil are taking over. Um, and it really sort of stuck out to me that these things were happening for real in the, you know, distant sort of, but not that distant past. Um, and so I got this idea that if I wrote about the two timelines, if I wrote about Trevor's story in, in the present and his great grandfather's story in, in the Second World War, um, I could sort of play around with the the dynamic between, you know, kind of, uh, not, not, you know, kind of not exactly um, making, not glamorizing the war, but, but, but certainly you don't want to in any way minimize the achievement of the people who won World War II. I mean, it really was probably you know, my first uh, my first Google search for World War II, what popped up was, uh, World War II is the largest single event in human history. And I was kind of like, I didn't even know we had a largest single event. So, so winning it has got to be the largest single achievement. But at the same time, you, you know, especially kids who play a lot of video games and glamorize first person shooters and, and you know, you know shoot them up kind, kind of games. Uh, I thought it was a great chance to sort of tell my World War II story, but at the same time, really sort of step through that that balance. And that I think is what makes uh, war stories a little bit different. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, I have a million more questions, but I will invite you to read. Okay. Thank you. All right, let me just see what we got here. Very hard to read on Zoom to get the light right. Oh yeah. The flash came a split second before the explosion. The bakery disintegrated around the soldier, collapsing into dust. At the last instant, he hurled himself out onto the street, just as the heavy wooden door frame came down. He was alive, but now he was exposed. He could feel the dozens of German rifle barrels closing up, drawing a bead on him. And then hope. Rattling up the ruined street came the first of the Shermans, late to the battle, but maybe not too late for him. 
The soldier leaped onto the tank, scrambling up over the tread to a precarious purchase on the lumbering vehicle's side. There he hung, holding on with his left arm as he fired blindly at the German positions with his right. One by one, adversaries went down, infantrymen, a machine gun nest, and the missile came in with a whistling sound, a shoulder launched anti-tank shell. He propelled himself free just as the Sherman blew apart in a huge fireball. The explosion launched him forward toward the German line. He hit the ground, somersaulted once and bounced up, shooting. Trevor, came a voice from behind him. Blam, 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 the rifle kept firing, taking out enemies left, right, and center. A German bullet tore into his shoulder. It didn't slow him down. Louder this time. Trevor, I'm busy. Trevor Firestone's thumb worked like a piston on the game controller in his hands. On the screen, the, shoulder took shot, the soldier took shot after shot. Three more bullets ripped into him, knocking him down to one knee. He fought on, bellowing in anger, triumph, and pain. Trevor bellowed right along with him, wrestling with the controller as if it would help destroy the enemy. Pop. For a moment, the soldier was frozen there, his face contorted with agony and heroic effort. Then the screen went dark. What? Trevor wheeled to find his father leaning over the game console, the plug in his hand. What'd you do that for? I was in the middle of this amazing battle. I think two and a half hours of battling is enough for one day, Daniel Firestone told his son. No, Trevor exclaimed in true pain. Didn't you see how many Germans I was killing? It had to be a personal best. I can't believe you pulled the plug before my progress could get saved. How am I supposed to level up now? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, we can see already there's going to be a sharp contrast between uh, the video game war and the actual war. <laughs> um, thanks. Okay, Carol, let's move on to you. Um, same question. And the first part of the question was, the how did I come to be interested in, in, in the, the Second, Second World, World war? war? And yeah, to write a book about this particular time and place um, within that context. Okay, sure. Um, well, first of all, both of my parents were involved in the Second World War, and I originally thought that I would write something, as Michelle described, from their point of view, but um, I just couldn't quite get into that. Uh, but I want, And I wanted to understand more about the war than I already knew, so I began reading um, books, works of history and found it very interesting. And I should say at the same time that when I was quite young, and perhaps this was as a result of having parents who were in the war, um, I became aware, very aware of what had happened. And I still remember probably at the age of 10, being quite shocked and horrified and thinking I'm part of this species that makes war in this way and commits these uh, terrible atrocities. And, and it really haunted me for quite a while. <clears throat> so in any case, I began um, sort of working on this a little bit. And I wrote some uh, from one character's point of view. And then as often happens when you're writing fiction, another character kind of appears from nowhere. And in my case, it was the character of Anna, <clears throat> who um, in the novel is a child, but I, I imagined her as a young woman living in the United States mm -hmm. after the events that took place in the novel. And, um, and I had a lot of trouble writing from Anna's point of view because her life was so different uh, from mine. And she was born and grew up in Prague, which is a city I know very little about, or I know more now than I did then. Um, and, and so I, I always had Anna's story in my mind as I was working on the first section of the novel, which is Natalia's story, Natalia and Miklos, whom she eventually marries. And um, I just, I, I found it really a privilege in a way as a writer to have these characters kind of open themselves up to me as I wrote 
and I became more immersed in their lives. And I do have that problem, I think, that some writers have. Um, it's kind of debated, do you control the characters or do they control you? Mm -hmm. And I really felt that these characters had actual lived lives that I had to discover, which is kind of an exciting part of writing fiction when it begins to seem not like fiction, but real life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, your characters do feel like fully realized people with very complex lives and um, lives that are all intertwined with each other in very interesting ways. Oh, thank you. That's good. Yeah. And I almost want to live every minute of their lives. And really, you have to discipline yourself. You can't describe every minute of every mm -hmm. character's life, obviously. And then um, I had to take these characters through some very dark events and, and live that with them in a meaningful way without um, perhaps over-dramatizing the events with which most people are familiar, but not everyone. And I think that is an important part uh, of writing about the Second World War. Although, as you said, there are lots and lots of books on the Second World War, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. It, um, it's really important. Agreed. And yeah, that, I Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, yeah, I just wanted to say I want to come back to with all of you to that topic um, of writing about re some really horrific experiences that your characters go through and how you deal with that. But first, I'd like to ask you to read from your book. Oh, Kara. Yes. And this, uh, this is from a uh, section towards the end of the novel. After um, most of the tragedy has occurred, uh, but Anna and Natalia, who knew each other in Prague, meet again in, um, as prisoners, actually, in a concentration camp, not an extermination camp, but a concentration camp in Western Berlin, uh, sorry, west of Berlin, where uh, the British Army has liberated the camp and professionals have moved in, a young social worker with the United Nations Relief, uh, Relief and Refugee Agency, is there and he takes an interest in Anna, who's 15 years old. He um, gives her a pair of shoes that he gets for her from uh, the United States. He gives her a chocolate bar. And at this time, um, the former prisoners are able to uh, get together. They're communicating, there are people there who are involving them in sports and music and entertainment and planning for their future lives. And uh, so Anna has been given a chocolate bar by the young social worker, and she shares that with Anna, and they sit outside in the sun, and nearby, a man played a violin. And when he took a break, he came over to where Anna and Natalia were seated and said this was his farewell performance. He was leaving in the morning, for a displaced person's camp. Do I congratulate you, Natalia said. <clears throat> Pardon me. He laughed. His name was Zoltan. He was Hungarian. He was from Kastai. I know that town, Natalia said, shading her eyes from the sun. I met my husband there, or near there. I'm not going back, said Zoltan. I have friends who emigrated to Los Angeles years ago. They're in the film industry and they're going to see what they can do for me. You're a filmmaker, a playwright. That is, I'm an architect. I was an architect and I got inspired to write one play, a smidgen of a one act play, but eventually it got produced at a theater in Budapest. My husband is a writer, Natalia said. What's his name? Natalia told him her husband's name. Are you kidding, Zoltan said. He held out his arms, the violin in his hand. I knew him for God's sake, a long time ago, in Budapest. 
there was a group of writers, architects, musicians, composers who called themselves the Elastics. And I hung around with them. And so did your husband sometimes when he was in Budapest. By the way, he said to Anna, do you know why we called ourselves the Elastics? The shoes, Natalia said, exactly. The shoes we wore with elastic sides, no laces. I want to ask, and I'm afraid to ask, where is your husband? Is he well? You mean, is he alive? I don't know. I'm going to find him, Natalia said. Anna listened to Natalia and this man called Zoltan and leaned forward, her elbows on her knees, so that she could admire her shoes, which did not, thank goodness, have elastic sides. A British soldier was playing soccer with some of the boys. They were all different ages and spoke many languages, but they all seemed to know how to play soccer. People walked past where she and Natalia were sitting. Six weeks ago, they were in hell. And now, here they were, strolling in the sun. People were remarkably durable and resilient, maybe too resilient. It shocked her a little. She didn't know what to make of it. Perhaps on the inside, in the soul, in the heart, it was a different matter. She felt happy, and yet she also felt angry all the time. Once in a group of doctors walking past, Anna saw her mother. Her crown of braided hair shone in the sun. She was wearing a gray wool flannel skirt, a blouse she liked, and over this, a doctor's white coat. Look, Anna nearly said to Natalia, look, my mother is here, but she knew that her mother was not, in fact, there. Thank you for that beautiful reading, Carol. Thank you. Um, before we go on, I just like to say to the audience that if you have questions um, for our readers today, you're welcome to type them into the chat bar and we will get to them um, a little bit later, but don't hesitate to write them down. Um, and uh, so Carol already touched on this about, uh, you know, in any, these are all stories of survival uh, for sure. And within stories of survival, there's kind of inevitably stories of other people who don't survive and um, stories of loss. Um, and, and in this case, you know, really kind of atrocious violence and trauma. So I just, I'd like to ask, I mean, you're all writing for actually different ages, um, you know, from very young to young adult to adult, but you do all have young characters in your stories who witness um, really horrific uh, scenes of violence and, and lose people close to them in shocking and traumatizing ways. So I wonder how you um, this is, again, a very broad and complicated question, I'm sure, but how you came to figure out how to do that for your particular audience and for your particular characters in a way that was both um, honest and not gratuitous and um, served your story and your readership. So I guess I'll start with you again, Michelle. Um, well, it's a great question. And uh, the answer is that I had to keep changing it a lot. Um, it, it was I, it was really important to me to be honest to the times, but so, so you couldn't sugarcoat what had happened. But at the same time, of course, you don't want to traumatize your readers. And nor did I want to numb them, because that was mm -hmm. what I found when I was reading through the research, particularly of, of rape, that there was so much of it that after a while, you're just sort of reading it and thinking, yeah, OK, OK. And then I thought, no, I, that is not the <laughs> that is not what I want to to transmit in my novel. I, and so I, I think in that sense, less less is more. Um, I had to sort of focus on just a few things that that were going to happen like that. But one of the hardest um, moments I felt, and I'm not giving anything away by telling this because it happens right near the beginning of the book, is, is when um, Ketch's mother is shot. Um, and one of the reasons why it was so hard for me is that in the previous um, uh, draft of the novel, Muti uh, lives throughout the entire mm. novel. So I got to know her as a character very, very well. And then I, you know, rewrote the book and put her in the beginning and 
and killed her off right at the beginning. And that was trauma. I, I don't know how readers felt about it, but for me, that was, it was a very traumatic choice because I had grown attached to her and I, or I sort of saw her as my grandmother, even though, you know, that's not who she was, but she was kind of based on her. So, so I had, um, I mean, I struggled with, with that. I struggled with most of the moments of, mm -hmm. um, of violence and trauma. Um, they are, they're hard to write because, you know, as a writer, you're putting yourself in the shoes of your characters and you're right there, you know, living through this. And, um, you know, when I think about my mother, uh, having gone through these, I, I don't know exactly what she went through because of course there are things that she didn't tell me. And I think there's probably things that she blocked out. Um, but she probably saw a lot more than, than what I know. And, and so I, you know, I would be also extrapolating and thinking, you know, my mother, probably saw things like this. And I, and it's, it was very hard for me to, to be in those shoes. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering about that scene in particular, because it does take place so early in the novel and it leaves the character who's very young and her barely older sister um, on their own as orphans. And also with the guilt of, you know, feeling responsible for their mother having been shot in front of them. So um, like, it's not only, um, the, her, the horror of seeing that happen, but then the aftermath and being alone and living with the guilt of it. So that was a really heavy weight to, uh, for your characters to bear. And I, yeah, I mean, you answered my question, but I was wondering how you came to decide to do that. And I mean, I guess you just answered that already. But, yeah, well, I mean, I, honestly, I don't really remember how I decided to mm -hmm. do that. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of YA writers tend to get rid of the parents <laughs> yeah um just so that the, so that the um the characters have more agency I, I don't think that was the reason why I did that I I don't remember my decision I wrote this novel so many times mm -hmm. that I actually had to reread it to make sure I remember which version <laughs> I was, ended up being published but one of the things I did struggle with was the aftermath of the shooting because I Katja and Hilda have, you know, in, interactions where they're joking around with each other and, and there is, you know, some humor in, in the novel that sort of lightens the, the, the heavy mood. But I had trouble with, you know, where do you put that in right after your mother has been shot? Like you can't, they can't all of a sudden be joking around and so time has to pass, but then a reader doesn't want to wade through 30 pages of time passing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, the, and the characters grieving. So that was one of the, uh, the big challenges was to how to get the story moving and yet also be true to the emotional landscape of having just seen your mother be shot. So it was, it was challenging. Um, it, it was probably twice as long as it is, yeah, as it ended up being, yeah. I had to cut a lot of things out. So not yeah. surprising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Gordon, how about you? How did you decide how to handle the scenes of death and, and violence for a young audience? Well, I, I think probably had to be, you know, the most careful just because, you know, War Stories is a, a middle grade novel. So it would, would sort of reach the, uh, the youngest audience. I mean, I think that uh, in terms of in terms of the character of Trevor, right, because of the structure of the novel, he himself didn't encounter World War II directly, right? He he got everything through through his grandfather, great grandfather's stories. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing is, you, you know, from from our perspective as adults, uh, Jacob Firestone, the great grandfather, was actually seventeen years old when he when he was going through the war. So to me, he seems like kind of a kid too. Yeah. To, to middle grade readers, it's like ah, seventeen. You know, that's that's pretty old. He's ready to, <laughs> yeah. to, to kind of kind of take it on, but. Um, I mean, I think that the word you used as you introduced the the, um, the the whole question was honesty, right? You just have to be really, really honest. Um, you know, that doesn't mean I have to sort of go, you know, full on blood and gore, although, although certainly, uh, you know, when you're doing research about uh, any topic, but, you know, certainly World War II, um, you're given a lot of choices, right? It's such a vast amount of material that you get to choose what you use and and what you don't use, you know. Mm -hmm. And like one of the one of the things that that I never thought of, but any description of of battles in World War II, one of them is just that that all these areas smelled because so many farm animals were killed during the course of these crossfires that and and, and no one would do anything with with those carcasses. So there were just vast amounts of decaying 
animal carcasses everywhere. That was something that I chose not to put in my book. Right? I mean, I was just thinking, I don't remember I, that. I think, <laughs> I, think it, it, I mean, it, it's honest. It certainly really happened. But I think yeah. that would, would really freak a kid out, just the yeah. idea that, 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 that this is going on. Um, you know, I was fascinated actually by, by what Michelle said, because it, it, it never occurred to me uh, when, when a writer makes a decision to kill a certain character, have a certain character die, is it different when you've already done a draft of the book where that character sort of made it through and, and lived for the, for the entire book? And I, yeah, I totally get that that could be a much more kind of real death from the standpoint of, of the writer then. Um, one of the things I thought was, was, was a very interesting scene to write in, in war stories is at the very end, um, there is a scene uh, of, of Jacob and his, his war buddies uh, from right before they go into battle. And in that case, I'm writing in the present tense about, uh, about characters who by this point in the book, the reader, the pretty young reader already knows is not gonna make it and how much more weight their words and actions would take in, in that you know, pretty small kind of light scene. Um, yeah. And I, I sort of felt like that was the one that I kind of used as sort of a lodestar to guide me through um, exactly what my readers, you know, they, I mean, even though it, it certainly was not a gory scene or a violent scene, it was a scene that made you think about all the things that were to come. Yeah, it really works very well, that scene. And I know uh, the scene you're talking about, and it is like these young, I mean, young from our perspective, I guess not that young, like you said, from the reader's perspective, but essentially teenagers kind of like off going off on an adventure and bonding and becoming friends. And you know, you know, which one's going to make it, and which ones aren't. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's very, it works very well. And it really brings home because I know like what you're trying to do in the book is show how, you know, war is not a game, essentially, like this is not fun, a fun, uh, fun video game type experience when you're actually living it. And that's, I mean, one way you could do that is by like, with like the shock value of blood and gore and violence, and you don't really do that, but by having that emotional like making the reader feel that emotional loss of like these actual young men is really right. I mean, I think one of the, the ironies is that the, in, in war stories, the most violent scenes are all in video games. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, Carol, you already touched on this a bit, how you try to find a balance between, again, honesty and, um, you know, shying away from scenes of violence and you know, bodily horror and so on. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yes. Well, one of the things that I tried to do in this novel was to um, contrast the lives that the characters had as these events were beginning to unfold. And, and I chose to, because I couldn't leave anything out, <laughs> I chose to include um, history from the uh, beginning of the, the Soviet revolution, the, the beginning of the Soviet Union. And so there are, there are little fragments of history from the First World War, the, um, the revolution in 1917 that, that led to the Soviet Union. And um, there are incidents of brutality that are reported that are associated with those events that um, I, I feel are, in, are presented in the novel from quite a distance, from an historical distance, and contrast with the normality of life. Mm -hmm. It does go through quite a few years before leading up to the Second World War. Yes. And I, I wanted to uh, to show what life was like in Germany before the war and after the war and how this can happen <clears throat> and did happen to the most ordinary people whose lives were very happy and fulfilled and complete 
before the war and then the violence that happened, I feel, was the complete ripping apart of their normal lives. So there are some scenes of brutality. They're very short, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where Natalia does undergo some torture. And um, it was difficult to write for two reasons. One was I wanted to make it believable, in which case I would have to be explicit. And I didn't yeah. want to do that because yeah. I, I didn't want to trespass almost in a way on the real people who had really experienced these events. I mean, it's really a problem, I think, not to want to exploit stories of, of torture or violence, but at the same time, to give a sense of how horrific it is to live through something like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it was a matter of balancing constantly and um, rewriting and writing and rewriting. Right, yeah, as it always is, right? Um, I'd like to just invite the audience again. I mean, this is your chance to ask any questions that you might have. So just type them in if you'd like to. And um, in the meantime, I will ask a couple of smaller things. Michelle, I was wondering about uh, music in your book. There's a huge role for um, Katya's love of music. So how did, how did that come about in your story? Well, that was part of the fictionalizing of the main character because in the beginning when I, the first draft I wrote, Katya was basically a stand-in for my mother. Um, and when I realized that that wasn't gonna work and I had to make her into some, somebody different, um, I gave her music, which is something that I grew up with. Um, mm -hmm. I, I played piano for many years um, uh -huh. growing up and then set it aside for a while and actually just have a piano coming on Monday because I haven't oh, played in a really long time. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. But I, I, most of the music that she discusses is music that I've played. Um, and so and it, it's, it's important to me. It's something that I grew up with. And so that's, and I feel like music is a, um, is a language that transcends other things and it, it becomes a counterbalance uh, as Carol was talking about sort of balancing out the violence. I, I felt like music was one way to, to create that balance so that, that there was a little bit of joy in the book as well. Yeah, it works really well. And it also gives you an opportunity to write some amazing scenes um, mm. where the character goes to great lengths to be able to find and play a piano. Mm. Yeah. Um, and Gordon, this is a sort of a slightly uh, superficial question, or I, I don't know, but your book is set in 2020 and it's kind of like ends up being in this alternate world where there's no pandemic, right? So I'm curious, I mean, I just was feeling for you as a writer thinking, you know, like this has to be, this had to be set in 2020 because it's the 75th anniversary. Um, well, I learned the lesson of, of uh, you know, when you make the, not that it's a bad thing to put hard dates that, that have not yet happened in, in a book, but that when you do, uh, you, you are certainly subject to what really happens on those hard dates. <laughs> yes. um, so I think that uh, in paperback, uh, we have changed that so that uh, it now just says present day for all the uh in, instead oh, okay, of okay okay just because 2020 is just such a trigger kind of uh kind, kind of year when kids yeah. see that they're like oh that's not possible like because i couldn't <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it certainly it, it certainly is still you know must be 2020 because it is the 75th anniversary of, of ve day but um but it doesn't actually like give specific dates in in 2020 anymore yeah Okay, that's interesting. Because yeah, the copy I have does, and I was like yeah. part of. I, I mean, like, as, writers, I'm sure, <laughs> as writers, I'm sure we've all dealt with little situations yeah. like that coming out. Um, you know, my my first book went through revision the year that Canada switched to the metric system. And I remember <laughs> being a 13 year old kid trying to figure out, you know, how to change. He inched his way across the windowsill and. <laughs> So, uh, you know, stuff happens and uh, it, it certainly it certainly did in a big way with war stories. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're not the only writer to have set a book in 2020 and then uh, had to figure out what to do about it. <laughs> um, Carol, um, I'm curious what you think about, you know, I think, I think it was you who was talking about how this is history, not ancient history, though. And, you know, we're getting to the point now where a lot of people, most of the people who actually lived through this time are no longer with us. And I wonder if, you know, we're going to continue to tell our children about it, if it's going to continue to carry the same weight. I know this is, again, a huge question, but um, what, what, do you, what do you think about that, about, you know, the legacy of the Second World War and how it's been so huge in our, you know, imaginations since it happened and now it's just starting to get a little bit more distant. It is. I mean, it's getting very distant and and there's so much intervening history that will fill in and take the place of that. And it is, but first of all, I should say that I really do believe that from that point, from the events that occurred during those years, everything must have changed for, for humanity, for people. I mean, it really is a horrific and colossal event. And there's never been anything like it. Mm -hmm. And it just, it cannot be forgotten. And there are a lot of history, history books, who are, you know, not fiction, but history books that document the events of those years and those books are really important but to re to reach people who are not historians or particularly interested in history or studying history i think it is necessary for fiction to uh, to do that to undertake that task and mm -hmm. um, in fact i came across this week a quotation and i think it is from um, a writer Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Sapiens and other books. And <clears throat> I wrote it down, I'm just gonna read it. To understand the world, you need to take fiction seriously. And I thought that was a beautiful quotation and it really um, exemplifies what, what I'm trying to say that um, we have to understand what happened and not forget it. And uh, fiction is perhaps Fiction and theater and film are, are ways that we can do that. Thank you for that, um, Carol. And uh, Cynthia is uh, back with us. I know she has some questions for you as well. We do. We're almost at the end of our time, but we did get two questions from the audience that I would love to pose to you. And this one is um, for Michelle and probably Carol as well. And the good question is, what did your mothers think of your novels? Uh, well, my mom loved it. And at that, it's, it actually is a good question because I was a little bit nervous um, about handing her over a book, you know, from the German point of view that really does ask a lot of tough questions about, um, you know, what did German people know? What did they not know? What was their responsibility um, when it came to helping people who they saw were in trouble? Um, I wasn't sure how she was going to respond to that or my other relatives for that matter. And they all responded very favorably. Um, I think my mom feels, um, I think she feels kind of honored that I spending the time to, to think about where she came from and what she lived through. Um, so yeah, but it was, I, I, I was, I was definitely nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she does feel honored in the way you did it. Carol, what about your family? How did they respond? Um, well, my mother was always very supportive of my writing. Uh, she didn't get to read this novel, and I wish she had. Uh, and, and also, in another way, it is perhaps good that she didn't, because I wrote um, mostly about German characters who are very sympathetic. And um, my mother, as a, a young girl, a teenager, went through um, the war living in one of uh, England's most heavily bombed cities. She lived through the Blitz. And uh, so it would be interesting to know what she would have thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm sure she would have appreciated your beautiful writing and the approach that you took. And this other question that I have is, um, it's lovely because it reflects, I think, the way the audience feels when they listen to you talk about the way you approached your material. And it was, did any of you cry while you were writing the novels? And um, not meant to be, says <clears throat> this questioner, a silly question, just wondering how this writing might have affected you. Me? Carol. Uh, that is a really good question. It, it did affect me a lot. I was surprised, in fact, at how, how real um, or how much I became involved with the characters' lives. I perhaps didn't quite dream about them, but came close to that. And uh, their tragedies really touched me. Um, I don't think I cried when I was writing the novel. I always keep that little dictum that Anton Chekhov had, you know, right, how did he say it? Right with a cold heart or a cold eye. And um, so no, I didn't cry, but I came close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, Gordon. Did you, did you shed a tear? I don't think I did, I, 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 because, because obviously I follow Chekhov, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm down with Chekhov. Um, no, I, I yeah, certainly became emotional, particularly the scene at the end uh, where, where I was writing about characters, some of whom did not survive the events of the book. But um, I, you know, and this is, this is going to seem kind of silly, but I can get pretty emotional in a book, regardless of how sad the content is. You know, I, I remember a long time ago, I, I wrote a, a, a book about a, a kid playing little league baseball and, and he just wanted to throw a curveball and he could not throw a curveball. And, and, you know, it just kept coming back to it again and again and again. And finally at the end, like he threw a curveball, like, a, you know, the, the ball went out there straight and it finally curved. And I, I don't know why, maybe it was just because I was so, involved in in this kid's struggle and I, I i sort of suffered through his suffering through this entire extremely light uh not not particularly sad book uh mostly a comedy that when he was able to throw this curveball i kind of choked up a little bit and uh so i think that that going by me the, the content of the book no matter how emotional it is no matter how sad it is no matter how tragic it is uh, is, is not any more likely or less likely to make me get emotionally involved when I'm writing a certain scene. I'm with you on the baseball, Gordon. Um, Michelle, you have the last word. Yeah, well, I guess I'm the weepy one of the crowd because <laughs> I cry every time I read my book. Um, and I have had to read it a few times, as I've said, because I forget what, what, I, what I decided on. Um, uh, and I changed the ending many times, but the ending is, is where I tend to cry. And I got really attached to um, the character, I, I won't say too much about it, but of Harry Johansson, who actually ended up being um, a throw-in uh, in, in a later draft, because I, I didn't have him in the beginning um, of the novel that I had conceived. And um, yeah, at the end of the book, every time I read, I feel like such a dork because I'm crying. <laughs> So I don't know. I guess I don't really follow Chekhov. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's okay. I think you did a great job. Um, so uh, thank you to our audience for asking these questions. Thank you to all of you on my behalf. And now I'll turn it back over to Mary. Mary.